together this morning. Let's ask God to open our hearts and our minds and our eyes to see what he has for us today. Let's sing together. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. Before you have a seat, turn around and say good morning to someone close by. So good morning, Stafford Crossing. It is great having those of you here in our worship center. And if you have us on a screen somewhere, thanks for inviting us in. My name is Daryl, one of the pastors. I want to welcome all of us, especially greet those who may be your first time guest or maybe you've been watching for or attending for several weeks or months, but have yet to say, hey, I'm here and I'd like to take a step 
to get more connected. And so our connection section uh, on the paper copy, or you can scan the QR code, or you can go to our app, which is where I am right now, and you can get it there as well. And you can just say, hey, here, here's my name. Here, I, This is my information. Let's begin a conversation to see how I can take some spiritual steps. So I would encourage you to submit that so that we can begin that journey together. You can also find things on our digital bulletin regarding prayer requests, uh, continue your generous giving to God. Also, you can find out things happening in the life of our church. For instance, we're going to be having a baptism service in a couple of weeks. And to get ready, we have some baptism info classes that are taking place today and next Sunday. So right after this service, before you rush off to Taco Bell, make certain that you, or wherever you happen to go, where just make certain that you stop by the office just for a few minutes and you can get all your questions answered about baptism as well as getting prepared for that spiritual step. You'll also find on our digital bulletin about a mission trip to Mexico. So excited that we're back in the international scene doing missions work, and you can check that out. Our students began this journey last year when they went to Mexico, and this year they're going back and making it like a family trip, so it's not limited to, to uh, high schoolers, um, but it's uh, for anybody in our church family. But the deadline is fast approaching. In fact, this Wednesday, there is a Zoom information kind of gathering, and you can check that out on our website or for our app. So glad you're here this morning as we worship our great God together and kick off a new series in a bit. So let's go ahead and come back to our feet and let's worship to get our hearts ready.
scripture tells us that where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. And so as we get, begin this new series about generosity, I thought it might be a good place to start to check our hearts and recenter it around our God. So this morning we're going to acknowledge his greatness, his goodness, his kindness, and the fact that he's always able. There is no one like our God, none so loving and forgiving and generous and patient. So as we sing these next couple of songs, let's lay aside all that stuff that might have a hold in our heart and turn our hearts and our minds and our souls to him.
you hold our hearts together there's no one higher than you redeemer defender our great and mighty savior there's no one higher than you you are all
God, we are so in awe of you this morning. May that um, that part of the chorus that says, may my life forever praise the glory of your name. God, may that be true in us today and every day. God, speak to us as you, as Daryl comes to bring the word. Remind us of your greatness and your goodness and your generosity. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, today we are kicking off a new teaching series called Disruptive Generosity. Now, when a pastor starts talking about generosity and money and tithing, you know, meaning giving that dime of every dollar, people start feeling a little funny. So let's just acknowledge the elephant that's in the room. Uh, people start saying things like, well, see, that's really all they care about. That's all they really want. I mean, look, they got to pay for this building and who knows how much that clown makes. Um, you know, that's why I left my last church. I'll just, I'll just come back in three weeks when this is over. Now, just know, I understand those realities. And obviously, I'm going to lean in and I'm going to plead and beg and say, hey, don't check out. Instead, lean in to what God might be wanting to say to you, how God may want to be growing your heart and your devotion to him. Now, if I happen to make eye contact with you during this series, <laughs> it's not because you're a greedy bum who needs to step up your giving game. All right. It's I do it every week. If it fits, wear it, but otherwise just know I'm just delivering God's word and God's message. In our life of our church, there's only two people who input financial data into uh, our system so that we can have those wonderful tax records. And uh, just know that I'm not one of those. No one teaching is one of those. Nobody, none of our elders or our pastors know who gives what to God through our church. Now I have a mentor who thinks I ought to know and if you want to know more about that, you can see me. We'll have a great conversation. But again, there's only two people who know. But come back for a moment. And when you think about that word disruptive, what comes to your mind? Disruptive. Well, the Britannica Dictionary defines it this way. To cause something to be unable to continue in the normal way. To interrupt the normal progress or activity of something. So you read or you see a definition like that. And so the question has to come to mind is, do you view disruptive as something negative or something positive? I mean, just think about it. Something negative, something positive. You see, if you're a teacher and you are challenged by a disruptive student, if you're a flight attendant, right, you are really irritated by a disruptive student passenger, if you are a light sleeper, then you are annoyed by a disruptive spouse who snores. I mentioned no names. If you are flying to Jamaica, then you are frustrated by a disruptive thunderstorm that causes you to miss your connecting flight. But like many words in the English language, Disruptive also has positive connotations. I mean, the disruptive impact of medication causes the infection to leave your body. The disruptive systems of Amazon changed the way that goods are purchased and goods are delivered. And many people have that truck showing up way too often at their house, right? It's like, man, this is just way too easy. The disruptive imagination and vision of Steve Jobs led to touchscreen smartphones all the way back in 2007. The pandemic's disruptive force spurred changes in many industries and many organizations that have benefited us. I mean, who knew that groceries could be delivered to your house? Who ever thought about going to Taco Bell for curbside? You think about all the things that we do with the DMV. Man, there are so many of those things are online now. We're like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and Zoom, I know some of you have a love-hate relationship, but man, now, all over the world, we can connect with, for prayer. 
We can connect and do Bible studies and grow our discipleship using Zoom. So so just understand disruptive. It has negative as well as positive connotations. Which brings us now to the second word, generosity. What is generosity? Chip Ingram, in his book, The Genius of Generosity, is a great read, by the way, says this about the Hebrew and the Greek meanings of generosity. In Hebrew, generosity means to saturate with water. It's a symbol of life. It's to overflow in a way that actually brings life to people. And in the Greek, generosity means, to, uh, means ready to distribute, available to give time, talent, and treasures to bless others. And then Ingram writes this. He says, when you put all these together, you start to get a dramatic picture of a life that is overflowing with care and concern for others. And you think about disruptive generosity. I think it's quite natural and easy to think of a couple of groups of people when talking about generosity in general. There's those people who are just like mega wealthy, mega rich. You know, they they should be generous by golly because they got a lot. Why wouldn't they be generous? But know this, disrupted generosity has nothing to do with how much money we have or don't have. Zero. So a lot of people think, man, those mega rich people, sure, they ought to be. They should pay to have the lights on around here. But there's another group, the super spiritual. I mean, those people who it just seems that God just works abundantly through them. It's just amazing how he works through them. But know this, disruptive generosity has nothing to do with how spiritual you think you are or not. You see, it's easy to be dismissive. Man, I don't have the wealth of Elon Musk. Man, I don't have the spiritual pedigree, the spiritual maturity of Mother Teresa. So, man, I I don't know if I can be generous. I truly believe in my core that people really do not want to be selfish. I've never met a person I think just really wants to be. Now, I've met people who are. But I think in their core, it's not something they ascribe to be or aspire to be. Most people don't want to be selfish. Other people are like, yeah, you know, maybe I should just, can I just sort of settle for slightly generous? It seems like it might impact my life a little bit less if I'm just slightly generous. But man, when you think about um, over the top, lavish, abundant giving of our resources, man, just be honest, that can be a real challenge. Disruptive generosity. Today, I want us to see that disruptive generosity is others-focused sacrifice that blesses them and glorifies God. See, disruptive generosity has everything to do with our understanding of what God has given us, that he's given us all things. He's given us time and talent and treasure and energy. They all belong to him. And every day you and I suck breath with our lungs is an adventure of seeing how our lives are going to cross paths with others in such a way that we're able to bless them. And in that process, along the way, we also glorify God. God wants us to take some of the time that he's deposited into us and use it over here. And God wants us to take some of the talents he's deposited in us and use them over here. And God wants to take some of the, some of the treasures that he's deposited in us and use them over there. See, the goal of disruptive generosity, really God's heart, when it comes to our time and our talent and our treasures, it's really used to serve others and then then to enhance and deepen our relationship with God. See, God's heart is not that we just get things done. It's not that we're just generous people. I mean, there are generous people who do not know Jesus. But man, when a person's heart is aligned to the Father's heart and we're walking in unison with him, it drives us to a place of sacrificial, generous giving that blesses others and glorifies God. You see, know this about everything God gives us. It it drives us to intimacy with God. Whether it's our time, whether it's our talent, whether it's our treasure, God wants what it reflects, our heart. He drives us to intimacy with God. That's one of the major ways God connects our heart with his heart. It's a life 
that is overflowing with care and concern for others. It's a brilliant way to live. See, God uses disruptive generosity to challenge us, to lead us to a radical change from this worldly understanding of stuff. I mean, you and I live in a culture. Most would say it's the wealthiest nation in the world. And stuff pursues us. Wealth pursues us. The accumulation of things pursues us to the point that we have to be very careful not to fall into idolatry of more and more stuff. And instead, surrender, as we just sang, our hearts to God. See, disruptive generosity leads us to this radical change from a worldly understanding of simply using our time and our talent and our treasure to satisfy us, to make us happy, to a place where money does not have a grip on us, to a place where our time doesn't have a grip on us, a place to where our treasures don't have a grip on us or our talents. You see, when I see this phrase, disruptive generosity, it's got a really positive vibe because it breaks the grips of materialism. It breaks the grips that it's all about me. It breaks the chains that says, I got to have more. I want bigger and better now. And when we are able to align our hearts with the things of God, man, suddenly our intimacy with God just soars. Now, I'm guessing there might be one or two here, or maybe one or two watching here like, man, this idea of disruptive generosity sounds really good, but it sort of scares me. I'm a little bit afraid. What does it look like? How do we get there? Let me just lay out a couple of realities of what disruptive generosity does in the life and the heart of a disciple of Jesus. First, just know that disruptive generosity changes the focus of our lives. This is a good thing. This is where disruption is really positive. It's no longer what we want to accumulate. It's no longer even what we want to stash away for retirement. You know, some of the last words that we hear from Jesus, you might be surprised by this. They're not found in the gospel narratives. They're not in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, but it's in the book of Acts where Luke is quoting Jesus. And in this passage, he's, um, that Paul, I'm sorry, that Paul is writing, he's quoting Jesus as he's addressing the elders of the Ephesian church. And this is found in Acts 20, 35. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, that word blessed has all kinds of connotations, and people try to say, okay, what exactly does that mean? And you may look it up in a concordance or a Bible dictionary or Google it, and it'll talk about, yeah, happy or good or uplifting, encouraging, which, which are true. But it carries the idea of a much richer and much deeper aspect for a follower of Christ. It has this idea that, man, the one who is filled with Jesus is fully satisfied, not because of what they have, not because of what they possess, but it's because they experience more of the fullness of God. That's this idea, man, that we're more filled, more joyful because of our walk with Jesus. See, people who give are more blessed even than those who give hoping that they might get in return. I mean, this idea of disruptive generosity, man, it is a win-win proposition. The person who is giving, they receive joy by giving. And a person who receives, man, they receive joy by having a need met, by receiving something. I'd like to force to think about this word picture. You'll see a picture here of a stream. And just think of our great God who owns everything, all all. It all is his. He's dropping some time. He's dropping some talent. He's dropping some resources in this stream that flows to his children, who by the prompting of the Holy Spirit, then direct whatever has been dropped in the stream to others. The Spirit leads them to bless others with their time, with their talent with their resources. 
God says, I want you to be that stream to where what I own flows through the stream to you. And then the Holy Spirit leads you to distribute that. God wants us to be a stream, a life-giving stream. But you know what's easy to happen? It's easy for us to become a dam. Where God drops some things in the water and then it arrives to us and we're like, I'm going to hold this right here. I'm not going to share this. This is for my pleasure. This is for my enjoyment. God says, no, 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 no. I want you to be a stream, not a dam. You see, people whose lives become a dam, they're like, man, there might be a rainy day one day. You know, I, I, got, I got to have a contingency fund. I've got to save up for some difficult days. You just never know. So they keep accumulating. They keep hoarding. They keep saving. And then there comes that moment where they share, and so often it's like, yeah, I share. I guess that's what I'm supposed to do. I felt compelled to. I was just guilty. I had to do something. And there's no joy in being a stream that God has designed them to be. It's like, you know, they give, they meet that need, and it's like, well, I guess I paid the bill this time, you know. I paid the bill. There's no joy. I mean, just think for a moment, what is it like to be around generous people? I mean, yeah, you're, you're out to dinner, and they're like, no, no, I got the check. I, I'm paying. I mean, a generous person hears you're moving, and they're like, hey, hey, hey what times are you all going to be there? I'll come over Saturday morning, and I'll help you load it. I mean, who, who gets jazzed by moving? But, man, you're around a person who's like, hey, I'm going to be there. I'm going to help you load up. And you're like, man, that is a, a generous person. And when it comes to generous people, guess what? We're just like drawn to them. There's this magnetic field just pulls us to, toward generous people. It's like, man, I want to be more like them. I mean, generous people have friends. They're winsome. They're happier. Generous. Now, what's the opposite of Generous. Stingy, miserly. You know, you come across a person and like, yeah, yeah, man. He's just an old miser. She's an old tightwad. Miser. The root word for miser is the same root word as miserable. Selfish, greedy, non-generous. And you begin to look around, you'll notice these people tend to be alone. They're isolated. They're miserable. Now, in Christian circles, we have to be very, very cautious and very careful because it's very easy for us to say, oh, to uh, try to appear generous while having a stingy heart. You ever been there? Do you even know anyone that's there? Man, they want to appear really generous, but inwardly their heart is tight. Disruptive generosity. Something else about disruptive generosity, it helps us invest in what matters most. See, every one of us worships something or someone. And where our money goes, where our calendar shows our time allocations, where we use our best gifts indicates what it is that we worship or who it is that we worship. I'm so thankful that Jesus gives us some incredibly wise investment counseling back in the Sermon on the Mount, his most famous sermon, chapters uh, 5, 6, and 7 of the book of Matthew. And he gives us some wise counsel. And he's going to say in this text, hey, do not invest over here. Bad ROI. Instead, invest over here. This is really good ROI. And now let me tell you why. So let's look. Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Now, again, we have to contextualize this. First century Jews, what was that looking like? Well, their wealth was through all kinds of natural products like clothing and linen and metals and grains. That's how their wealth was accumulated in that culture. 
And so basically Jesus is going like, hey, just stop investing. Just stop trying to do everything here on earth to accumulate stuff. Because at the end of the day, the stuff you're creating, whether it's the metal, whether it's the grain, whether it's the linen, it can be destroyed. You can lose it. You know, you're going to have grain, but there's going to be some rats come in. They're going to eat the grain. You got this precious metal, but it's going to rust. You got something really nice in the house. A thief's going to come and get it. You can lose it. Don't let that be your focus. Now, sometimes people go to extremes and try to say things that Jesus is not saying. Jesus is not saying that we should not save. He's not saying that we should not have a rainy day fund. Elsewhere in Scripture, we see there's wisdom in living that way. He's not saying it's wrong to save. It's, it's not wrong. Jesus doesn't say it's wrong for us to have something that's nice. In, in fact, Scripture tells us that he's the giver of all good gifts for our enjoyment. So there's some balancing that we have to do as disciples. What Jesus is saying is this is a prohibition against greedy, selfish hoarding. And this is something nice, and I want it now. And my life and my success and my power and my happiness is not going to be fulfilled unless I get it. Then Jesus moves and he gives us a positive command in verse 20. But store up for yourselves, and this is, my friends, this is for our benefit, this wise investment counseling from Jesus. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what would it look like to have treasures stored up in heaven? You might want to read over in Luke 16 this week. I don't have time to dive into the text this morning. But it sort of outlines this idea that when people who sort of pay it forward, people who are generous, who practice disruptive generosity, and there are people who end up in eternity, in heaven because of them, it's like there's going to be a welcome committee for them. It's like, hey, I'm here because of you. Because of your radical generosity, because of your disruptive generosity, I am in heaven today. And they're going to be like welcoming those of us who were disruptively generous. It's that idea of giving a cold cup of water in the name of Jesus. There's relief. There's love that comes. Now, Jesus gives us this wise plan to protect us, to guide us. Because, again, it's to bring us back to intimacy with God. There have been seasons in ministry these last 33 years where I do more financial counseling than marriage counseling. I do more financial counseling than addiction counseling. I mean, it's just amazing how money and resources impact every person at some level. And believe it or not, I love teaching on generosity. And I love teaching on resources and finances and God's plan. And you're going like, you're weird, why? Why? It's because I've seen what it does in my life. I, I see what it's like when I was, when Gene and I would get our WIC coupons in the mail and we would go get food for our boys and yet we would honor God with our tithe. We didn't, we didn't cut corners because we didn't have money. God has to be first. And I'm not saying that to, well, well, you're one of those superstar guys. No, no, no. We, I, I've, I've seen it work with little. And I've seen it work in abundance. So when we follow God's financial plan, amazing things happen. And our intimacy with him is number one. It just soars. God, I don't have my, I'm trusting you, God, that I'm going to do this, and you're going to meet the need. I'm trusting you. It builds our intimacy with God. Sometimes people think, well, man, that's, God's just wanting something from me. He can't have it. Well, bro, it's his anyway. He's actually just letting you borrow it. You're to steward it. You're to resource it well. It's not about what God wants from us. It's what he wants for us. And he wants a path to financial freedom where stuff doesn't control us, where stuff doesn't grip our heart. But instead, the stuff that we have, it's like a stream. And because it's a stream, things flow through us and it flows to others. And they are blessed and God is glorified. Disruptive 
generosity. It's others focused and it does bless them and God gets the glory. I'd like for you to sort of lean in and, and watch this video of a story of disruptive generosity. I had an accident and my hip was broken in so many pieces. I have two rods in my hip. She's an angel among us. If you watch her in the bread company, everyone comes in to see Catherine. You know, we sell the bread, but I feel like there are some people who specifically come with prayer requests and uh, I go pray for them. One day when we were sharing, she said she was in need of a different car, that her car was needing expensive repairs. I had been saving money, but uh, I knew it wasn't enough, so I knew I would take a few years to save for it. So a couple months later, I went in and I said, Catherine, how's your car fund coming? And she said, I gave it all away. And I looked at her and, and she said, there was a widow in need and I gave her the $5,000. I struggled a lot when I gave that money. And uh, I said, I feel okay, but uh, do you think I did the right thing? I mean, I cannot give what I don't have, so I just give what I had. I was shocked, and so I come home and I tell Pete that we needed to help Catherine with her car fund. He looked at me and he said, no, I think we need to buy Catherine a car. And I said, okay, great. Pete called Scott and said, do you know Catherine Gray Harvest? And he said, yes, he did. Pete said, well, we'd like to buy her a car. He asked Pete, do you want to use your new car? And it just hit him right in the face. Why would he ask me that? Of course I would want a used car. That's good enough. He just paused for a moment and he said, I want a new car. And he said it was silent on the phone for a few seconds. And Scott said, whoa, I want to help. And so he pitched in some. So she came to the bakery and uh, she asked me, if you were to buy a car, what kind of a car would you like? I said, Debbie, I'm not really planning to buy a car. But she said, oh, just tell me. And she said, I'd like a SUV cruise control. And she said, I'd like a light color. And we called Scott and he said, I think I've got the perfect car. So Pete said, can we deliver it tomorrow? So we have the bread company owner and his family, Scott and his family and our family. And Catherine sees us all coming in and she's just all excited to see everyone. And uh, I went to give them hugs and I said, what's Pete doing here? I did have the, the biggest idea. When I went out, <laughs> and so we walked her over to the car. We said, Catherine, this is your new car. So, oh, I said, for me, this is for me. I said, oh, I, I knew God had many cars, but I didn't know he had a new one for me. So, God had new cars <laughs> for me. We all stood there in tears as we saw the joy on Catherine's face. And we got to be a part of it. And the joy of that was unbelievable. So right, but it was such an excitement to drive it. We told Catherine that we would like this to be confidential. 
but I kept running into people who would say, I heard what you did for Catherine. It wasn't even us, it was Catherine. It all started with Catherine giving up what she had to a widow to help her, and it just continues on. Generosity begets generosity. We don't give in order to receive. We give because it's the nature of Jesus Christ. He gave us his life. So we, we have the, the DNA of Jesus Christ of giving. <laughs> yeah, so this is one story I would never forget in my life. So Catherine practiced disruptive generosity. She gave her entire savings for her car to a widow lady. And as she said, generosity begats generosity. And then a family is moved to purchase a car for her. Now, now understand, I know it's very easy for you to go, man, I don't have $5,000 to share. There's no way I can buy somebody a car. And if you're having those thoughts, I think you're missing the point. The point is simply to be a stream. And whatever God drops in the water that flows to you, treat it with open hands and allow the Holy Spirit to guide you to the place where he wants you to pass it on. Do not become a dam. Don't. Because if you are a follower of Jesus, you have the DNA of Jesus in you. And the one who gave the best gift ever calls us to give as a symbol and as a representative of who he is and what he's done. Now, our premise in this series is that you desire, just as I desire, to be generous. I don't think we got a bunch of greedy bums in our church. But sometimes people cannot be generous because of some bad financial decisions they've made in the past. And so you're like, well, how can I get there? How can I be like Catherine? Or how can I be like this family who gifted her with a car? When my, my finances are a wreck. Well, starting in three weeks, we're going to begin another round of Financial Peace University. And we have done that for many years in the life of our church. And it's not just for, you know, rich people figuring out how to move their money. And it's not just for people who are bank, trying to avoid bankruptcy. It's for all disciples to figure out how to use God's resources God's way. Doug Thrash is here on the front. He's one of our elders and he oversees this ministry. And I asked him for some quick stats. These are the last four classes. It's a nine-week class. The last four classes in those nine weeks have paid off $420,000 worth of debt. And they have grown their savings by $243,000. A fun fact, they have cut up 175 credit cards and closed the accounts. I mean, folks, it is just practical ways to how we give, how we save, how we pay off debt. So there's a QR code on your sermon notes. Let me encourage you to scan the QR code, sign up, and invest these nine weeks to say, God, I want to be a stream. Lead me there. Disruptive generosity. So this idea of disruptive generosity has its root in one place, and that's in our good and kind, ever-generous God. He pours out his grace and his mercy, his kindness, his goodness, his strength, his power, and yes, even his provision on each one of us every single day. So we're going to teach you a new song that extols that generous spirit that God pours out on us each day. So will you stand with us as we sing?
withholds your love from us. Arms open wide upon the cross. You give no matter what the cost. Jesus, we see you. All of these worlds, your hands have made. A billion stars stretched out in space. These are just echoes of your grace. Jesus, we see you. You are the generous giver. Your mercy overflows. Your blessing is a river. On and on and on it goes. You are an endless fountain. You're filling up my life. My heart must sing your praises. Jesus, you be glorified. Be glorified. you reach us in our pain your mercy meets us every day your love will never turn away Jesus we see you oh, oh, oh. you are the generous healer. your mercy overflows much better so much more than we could ever think let's sing this together you're so much better you're so much kinder than anything we think you are your love is deeper your love is wider open our eyes so much better you're so much We're going to send you out today. Have a great week. Be a stream this week. There'll be folks in the back to take your ties, your offerings, and your connection cards. There'll be folks down front to pray with you if you have a need. Go and be blessed. <laughs>